have a song book and turn with me to 259. We'll get started. Let's all stand together as we sing Jesus Saves 259. sound. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph o'er the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills, deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Well, that's what we're celebrating today. If you're not saved, we'd like to celebrate your salvation. But it's your choice, really. The only thing that will keep you out of heaven is you're not believing the gospel. We know sin separates us from God, and that's why Christ died. And he's the one that will do the saving if we'll do the repenting and say, forgive me, come live in my heart. If you've never done that today, it's a simple process. You can even do it while I'm praying. Let's do it together. Lord, thank you that we have been saved, most of us, maybe all of us. If not, we pray that those that don't have the faith would have the faith today. That the music, the praying, the preaching, the fellowshipping, all this that we do would bring honor and glory to yourself and draw sinners to yourself so that their unbelief can be changed and exchanged for belief and have eternal life as a gift of God through Jesus Christ. Thank you again for the Bible that makes it clear. Help us to love the Bible. Help us to anticipate opening it here in a few minutes, reading, and then submitting to the authority of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, welcome each other. Take a few minutes and welcome each other. I gotta go run. Yep. Get how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. 145 is our next song. We're going to be singing 145 together as well with my soul song number 145. <clears throat> well, 
and peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Yes, wonderful words. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, to the end of the chapter, Matthew 18, 18. If you don't have a Bible, we have extra Bibles in the back. We'd like to share a Bible with you. We'd like to help you to get your own Bible, put your name and address, phone number in it in case it gets misplaced. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, and then to the end of the chapter. These are very strong verses encouraging us to forgive. 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 We have to be forgiven to be saved, and we have to forgive others to be in the will of God. So let's uh, read with this in mind. Matthew 18, 18, to the end of the chapter. Let's stand together. Brother Schrock will lead us as we read. Thank you. Matthew 18, starting in verse 18. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant fell down, therefore fell down, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning that we can be together again. Lord, it's uh, another day in your house, but Lord, I pray that it would be a special day. Lord, I pray that we would all look forward to coming to church every every uh, every time we enter the doors here to hear from you and, and to uh, fellowship with like-minded believers. I pray that we would be a body of believers that uh, is pleasing to you and brings honor to you. And Lord, if there's someone here that's not part of our body that... Uh, maybe it's not even saved yet, that they would uh, repent and, and believe. And I pray that you would uh, help us to listen out uh, as the, the rest of the service continues and help us to, uh, to appraise you in everything we do and say. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. Remember, we are sponsoring a couples outing this uh, Thursday night. Brother Schrock is collecting the money. We need a count today uh, I'm going to give the uh, restaurant tomorrow. So it's uh, we reduced the price to just $20 a person. That's a little more uh, down in our category. Somebody's agreed to subsidize the rest of it. That includes a dessert and the beverage, includes the gratuity, and we'll pay for it with the church credit card, and that removes the tax as well. So make out your check or cash to New England Baptist Church, and that saves us another seven and a half percent. It's a church-sponsored activity, and they've agreed to do that. So again, uh, if you haven't already made the plans, it's a great way to spend time with God's people. Uh, Brother Barnes will be there. Brother Robbie Day will be there, uh, uh, as well as others from their churches. Different churches around the area have been invited. So again, we're limited to 25 couples, so it's only the first 25 that we can accommodate. So if you're interested, please take care of that today. See Noah after the service. He'll be downstairs with Junior Church uh, after the service. Uh, Again, uh, the cookie exchange tonight. Don't let anything get in your way tonight. Uh, cookie Monster is going to be here. Uh, I assume somebody's making some cookies. I don't smell any at the moment, but uh, uh, this is the night that we're doing it, right? Uh, uh, see Samantha if you don't know uh, what's happening. She'll answer any question you have. That's after the evening service tonight. And remember, as the men come, we are praying about raising Bibles for foreign countries this, this month. We had $399 come in last month, last week. And we're asking you that forgot about it. Eight dollars will print and send a Bible to the foreign missionaries uh, to second and third world countries where they may not even be able to afford their own Bible. And we would have the joy of giving them their own Bible uh, for just an eight dollar investment. And so as you look around, uh, as you think, well, where does all the money come from? Uh, again, we give God the glory. We don't uh, check uh, uh, your 
financial account on the way in or out. That's between you and God. But the blessings come as you get your finances in order and as you share uh, uh, the giving. It's more blessed for you than it is to receive, especially those of us in this country. Um, we mentioned a few weeks back about Brother George Simpson. He was short on his rent. He had eviction notice upon him. We announced that, and we're happy to say that over $500 came in. Amen. It's been sent to him. We have a message on the answering machine. He called. He's very thankful. He said he had been thinking about stepping down uh, in his missionary work, and then the Lord told him, uh, no, don't step down. Step up because the labors are few. And so he's agreed to start another ministry of some kind, he lives down in Taunton area. That's about an hour south of here. So, And he asked us to pray for his wife. If a Brother Brewer would come to the pulpit here and pray, lead us in prayer for his will, God's will, and especially his wife, who's been very sick, partially paralyzed for years. They've spent 30 years in Brazil as missionaries. Now they're back here reaching Brazilians for Christ. But pray for his dear wife, if you would, as we thank God for the offering this morning. Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to come into your house. Father, we just ask for your um, blessing upon the, uh, the this offering you're about to receive, Lord, that uh, you use it to um, and spread it to the many areas as needed, Father. And Lord, we thank you for the good news of uh, Brother Simpson, Lord, uh, that uh, this need was uh, taken care of, Lord, that we know through uh, prayer and uh, lifting our needs unto you, Lord, it will come to pass. And Father, we ask for your healing, uh, comforting hand on um, Brother Simpson's wife, Lord, with the uh, um, this long time that she's been um, ill and uh, we just ask for your healing comforting hand be about her and the family lord now the lord carries throughout the rest of this uh, afternoon in this uh, service lord and the message laid on pastor's heart that are ho that will be open and receptive to your word and we'll go outside these doors lord uh, re and char uh, charged and energized and out to tell others about you in jesus name amen amen, amen. my wife's over here going to be playing the love of God and isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful as we give today. I enjoyed that so much, I almost didn't look up the song we're going to do, which is 162 in the song. Book. If you grab your hymnal now, turn with me to 162, to God be the glory. 162, let's stand together as we sing that. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved. 
Almighty, the world that he gave us, his Son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. <coughs> to the Father, Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Thank you, great singing, please be seated. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, National Marriage Week, uh, February 7th through the 14th. And today we are honoring marriage biblically. The world, the devil, the flesh trying to destroy marriage. And we as God's people, we must remind ourselves what God planned for marriage and 
how we can fulfill his plan for biblical marriages. If you're back there in Matthew 18 again, that's where we're getting our remarks this morning. You know, if you want to go to heaven, you have to receive God's forgiveness. And if you want to go with full reward and blessings, you're going to have to have a soft heart, be willing to forgive others. God did allow Moses, evidently, or Moses did it uh, with the liberty he had in Matthew 19. Remember, everything's in the Bible in a, uh, in a context. And so we have all these verses dealing with forgiveness in chapter 18, and then it goes right into marriage in chapter 19. And uh, the question is asked in verse 7, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, this is God giving the answer, Moses, because of the hardness, and he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So today we're trying to discern how we can help build stronger marriages and have stronger churches and have a stronger country. The weaker the, the family relationship gets, the weaker becomes the church and the weaker becomes the nation. So we're selfishly trying to build families for God's glory, for His glory and honor, I should say, not for our own selfish reasons, but that's where real happiness and joy comes from the relationship of a biblical marriage. And you say, well, I don't have a biblical marriage. My spouse is unsaved. Well, be patient. Don't expect uh, uh, it to come so quickly, but just do your part, and God says He'll do the rest. Just trust Him. There's a lot of poverty in the world. They've taken surveys to determine that Broken families have the more poverty-stricken children than uh, the families that stay together. So poverty, divorce does affect the children. It affects the total income of the family in most cases. So we want to encourage you. If you're married, stay married. If you're going to get married, plan to stay married until death do us part or realize it's one thing that will cause a divorce, and that's hardness of your heart. That will break a marriage. It will break any relationship, a hardness of your heart. Perhaps I could lead you today to say, I don't care what anybody will do to me, I'm going to forgive them. To come to that place right up front. I don't care what my spouse does to me, I still, if I'm going to be biblical, I have two choices. I can get a hardness of heart, or I can have a forgiving soft heart, be willing to forgive and work through the problem. Realize it usually takes two people to create a problem, and it's usually not all 100% zero uh, in relation to the, the one who's guilty of the most... Uh, sin in the relationship and we're not here to throw any stones at divorced people we're here to say we're trying to save marriage from total destruction the world the flesh and the devil is against marriage the abandonment of marriage greatly contributes to the childhood poverty in the United States according to the study that I'm looking at right now but we don't depend on studies of the world we just try to gain information and move on to the next major encouragement and that is even the country of Australia, which has been known to be very liberal politically, very liberal spiritually. We have missionaries there saying it's very similar uh, to Europe. It's very similar here to New England. Cold, hard hearts spiritually. However, just in the last few weeks, uh, 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 this good news came along that Australia's high court has struck down a law legalizing same-sex marriage in the Australian capital territory meaning that more than two dozen homosexual couples will likely have their same-sex marriages annulled. That's according to the New American magazine. So we're saying if that could happen in Australia, maybe there could be a reversal in America. There's some things happening that could be creating a revival here in America. This would be one of them, to get back to a biblical definition of marriage. A marriage is between one man and one woman, end of the subject about the definition of marriage. Now again, to get a marriage to endure until death do us part, that's the challenge of today. We all have choices. We have liberty to sin or not to sin. We have liberty to have a hard heart or a soft heart. That's all the responsibility that rests with on our shoulders. We have choices in our mind that reach into our heart or from our heart to our mind, whichever way, and then carry out the actions of forgiveness or non-forgiveness. So today... Think with me about the hardest of hearts. I have here in front of me the testimony of a man named William J. Murray. He's the son of America's best-known atheist, Marxist leader, Madeleine Murray O'Hara. Yet at age 33, he accepted Christ and began to preach the gospel. 
Amen? So let's not think that there's anybody too hard to be saved. Let's have the faith to go and say anybody can still be saved as long as they're still breathing. And it should be our privilege. This is his story. I'm reading from a tract that was he, he wrote himself. I was born into a home of near constant rage and violence. Can anybody identify to that? Constant rage and violence. Yeah, if you're not careful, you get bitter against your parents. The Bible says, honor your parents. My mother never married my father or my brother's father. As a result of my mother's constant angry outburst, she could not hold down a job, and she, my brother, and I lived with her parents and an unmarried uncle. My grandfather had never filed an income tax return, and most of what he did during his life was either illegal or ill-advised. He had no savings. My grandmother read tarot cards and sent out demons by burning human hair. My uncle kept hordes of pornography in his room, and my mother filled the home with statues of mating animals whom, or which she worshipped. That's Madeline Murray O'Hara. She worshipped animals. Is she still alive? Does anybody know? Or did she pass away? This is the testimony of her son. Continue. My mother accepted the communist doctrine when I was about 10 years old, and from that time there were socialist and communist study group meetings in the basement of our Baltimore home. I was taught that because there was no God, there was no such thing as right and wrong. This is the society we're living in today, ladies and gentlemen. There's no right and wrong, and uh, we have a, a different solution here. There is a right and wrong, and the Bible tells us what that is. My mother told me it was far better to be a homosexual than to be a Christian. She taught me that the most important things in life were the physical pleasures such as drink, food, and sex. For many years, I lived the life I was taught. I drank a quart of vodka a day, and by the time I was 30, I'd been married twice. I lived only to eat, drink, and have what I thought were sexual pleasures. But a time came when the women and the booze no longer gave me the happiness that my atheist mother told me that they would bring. And again, we're off the script now. We're trying to create in us that we're meeting people like this every day. We're rubbing shoulders with them in our society. When you give out a gospel tract and they show some interest, you're dealing with people like this more than just this one man that's giving testimony now. I was so consumed, I was consuming so much alcohol that it no longer got me high. I started using marijuana and other drugs to supplement the alcohol, which had betrayed me. At age 30, I began to realize how empty my life had been. There were no people in my life. My only friends were cigarettes and booze. It was that realization that led me to my search for God. It's getting good now, folks. Here he's searching for God when everything else failed. I had seen every evil in the world, and now I wanted to see the other side of life. I turned to a 12-step program to stop the drinking, and there found my first awareness of a loving God, yet that God had no name. In a novel, I read the story of the great physician Luke, and I yearned to have the relationship and love of God this man had, but I did not know how to reach God. On January 25, 1980, as I slept in my apartment in San Francisco, the Holy Spirit came upon me and directed me to seek the truth in the Holy Bible. Now, that's the kind of a Holy Spirit encounter that you should have if you haven't had that yet. Even if it comes at night, in the middle of the night, as it did to this man, this was the one place I'd never looked for the nature of God. For it was this very book that my mother had removed from our nation's schools by her lawsuit in 1963. Now awakened by the call of God, I drove to a downtown discount department store and there found a Bible under stacks of pornography. The gay checkout clerk laughed at me for buying a Bible. But it was in this Bible that I found the truth about Jesus Christ. Amen? The truth that sets every man free, the truth that Jesus had paid the price for my sin so I could be reborn and be a new man and have the gift of eternal life. I learned that this gift was mine for the asking. All I had to do was repent of my sins and ask Christ into my life as Lord. My life began again when I accepted Christ into my life. Your life can begin again as did mine. Just say this simple salvation prayer. And it gives a very beautiful prayer. My Father in heaven, I repent of my sins. I ask your forgiveness. I believe Christ died as a sacrifice to pay for my sins. I want to be a born again and become a new creature in Christ, I now ask Jesus into my heart as my Lord with the promise of living for Him. Once you've said this prayer, cast all the sinful things out of your house and your life. 
Call a church at once and tell the minister about your decision to follow Jesus. Attend church the very next available service. And for you, that'll be tonight at 6 p.m. I hope you'll be here. And rejoice in the fact that atheists can get saved from the worst of backgrounds and home environments that this man experienced. And if his mother is still living, let's again draw our hearts to her in prayer that she would repent and follow the testimony of her son, of her son. If we're not careful, we think uh, everybody is guilty, nobody's getting saved, the world's getting worse, uh, there's no sight, no end in sight. There is an end in sight. If Australia can reverse the definition of marriage to be a biblical definition, let's have the faith that could happen here in Washington, D.C. It could happen here in Massachusetts that sort of kicked off the, the trend in making that uh, legal, which God says is an abomination. May the Lord help us. Back to Scripture here. We have a man uh, asking questions. How many times do I have to forgive my brother in order to save a relationship? Would seven times be enough? He says, uh, verse 22, uh, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So if there's somebody aggravating you today, somebody irritating you, uh, you want to forgive them at least 490 times before you uh, ask that question again. Verse 23, the kingdom of heaven. Here's the illustration. How are we going to get this ability to forgive us 490 times? He gives the story. We just read it. Uh, somebody owed uh, 10,000 talents. Uh, somebody figured that that would be millions of dollars, nine and a quarter million dollars. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't recommend you loan that much money to any one person. It would be better to spread it out. Your chances of getting back would be better. Uh, this dear man didn't get it back. And so uh, he uh, forgives the, the, the guy the debt, and then uh, that guy goes out and loans somebody uh, approximately $15, and uh, he can't pay him back, and so he throws him in prison. And that's an illustration. This is a story to relate to us. How many sins have we committed? If it's been uh, one a day, uh, if you mount, uh, total up the number of days you've been live, uh, and uh, I say congratulations. If you can make it on one a day, uh, you, you're above average. It's probably more like one a minute if you're not controlling every thought and every uh, instinct that comes to you uh, we have quite an account built up against our holy God and we want to be very quick to forgive those who may have crossed our path once the wrong way or twice or three times or at least 490 times we want to be quick to forgive what's the option you say we just read it hardness of our hearts is the option back in the farm we uh, we didn't have uh, nursing homes in, when I was growing up and, and sometimes uh, people would get older Two or three generations would live in the same house. And, uh, and I remember the farmer I was working for, I never saw the, uh, the senior man of the house. And, and uh, we'd come up in conversation, well, where is so-and-so? And they'd say, well, he's suffering with hardness of arteries. Uh, wait, hold up there, the gal. We don't want everybody to leave at the same time. Here, sis, wait. Wait till those others come back. Wait till they come back if you're going to use the restroom. We only one one at a time to the restroom. Where's my guards at the door here? Wait till they come back. Uh, uh, you may need to hear this, uh, 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 and please, uh, we only have two bathrooms down there. Uh, we're, we're back to the subject, how am I going to save my relationships, uh, and what is going to create this hardness of heart any sooner? Well, it was the senior where the Smiths uh, and I worked. They said, uh, well, you know, the senior here, he's, he's suffering from hardness of arteries. Hardness of arteries, that was the term. Is He's probably mentally un incapable of talking to people anymore. He's bedridden. He's on his... Uh, his way out, uh, really the deathbed uh, indication that his body is not working properly and they do with him like they do in nursing homes. They care for you morning till night and now uh, homes that don't have nursing homes 60 years ago, they would care for them in their own home uh, as they were suffering from uh, physical problems, medical problems that come with uh, old age. But we have this illustration now here to convince us that we must, as saved people, uh, we can't lose our salvation, but we can become hard of heart and unforgiving. That's the thing, the tool the devil wants to use, and that's what's causing half of Christian marriages to fall apart. It seems something is causing Christian marriages to fall apart. We're trying to celebrate uh, National Marriage Week and strengthen marriage instead of destroy it and cut it away as our society, as our ungodly society wants to do. 
And so point number one is we must be willing to forgive our spouse and expect that they are going to sin against us, or if they're human, that is. Is there anybody married to somebody that's not human? We're against that. Uh, that would be uh, humans marrying animals, and that's what this, uh, all this trend in society is leading to. It, if you, if you, we live long enough, we're going to see that, unless there is a spiritual revival back to biblical truth. And so you and I are married to somebody that's less than perfect, less than, uh, than, than, than totally uh, correct up here, and I'm talking to myself. I'm trying to encourage myself today, by the way, because uh, if God can uh, allow something to cross my path or the devil that gets me upset with any one of you and I get bitter towards you, I'm finished as a Christian. I'm finished as an example and as a leader. I must be prepared to forgive you and forget whatever it is that uh, came between us because it's probably partially my fault anyway, unless I'm struggling with uh, uh, you know, the sin of pride, uh, the sin that I'm uh, superior uh, and that I deserve better uh, uh, than, than you're giving me. Uh, those kind of thoughts uh, uh, tend to come to people that have a problem forgiving. Uh, but if I say, well, I'm, I'm just dirt too. I was created out of the dust of the earth and I was uh, born a sinner and I'm going to die a sinner, but I'm going to die a saved sinner. How about you? And my goal is to die a sanctified saved sinner. Not just a saved sinner, but one that's filled with the Holy Spirit enough to forgive anybody that trespasses against me. And I am expecting there will be a few more that will trespass against me in my life. Now, here comes the question. When do I talk to somebody that trespasses against me? When their sin could be hurting them, I owe it to them to go and bring it to their attention in a kind, loving way. I don't have the authority to go in a superior way. I may have misunderstood the details of what happened. And so I got to go on a, search uh, you know, a, a searching mission to find out what really did happen. Uh, was it your softball that ended up on our porch or was it the neighbor's baseball uh, that ended up on our porch and the window happens to be shattered? Uh, uh, was it your uh, uh, sharp pointed knife that, uh, uh, that took the paint off the side of my nice uh, new shiny uh, used car? Or what could have been somebody else that was walking by uh, that did that uh, nasty trick? Uh, uh, and so we, we have a way of asking the right questions if it's bothering you. Was it you that shoveled all that snow on the front of, of my car and on the hood of my car? Or, or could that have been somebody else? Maybe two streets over. We need to find out before we get this hardness of heart of what the sin is, whether it's revolving around marriage, or around a friendship at work, my boss, my fellow employees, or where does this problem uh, originate? So we get to the end of the chapter, verse 34. We've got these two men that have borrowed money. One couldn't pay it back. He forgave him. The other one couldn't pay him back. He threw him in prison. Well, what's the, uh, the teaching? What's the moral of the story? Verse 33, Shouldest not thou ha also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Shouldn't we forgive brothers and sisters, especially Christians? Shouldn't we forgive even the unsaved world? If Jesus has forgiven us, look what they did to him. Nails in his hands and his feet, crucified, uh, beaten on the head with the crown of thorns. Uh, and he's forgiven us all of our sins, shouldn't we have pity on those around us that are living in sinful lives, whether they be saved or lost? We owe it to them to forgive them because we've been forgiven. If we have, that is. If we have. However, if we have a hard heart, we've never made peace with God. Uh, we don't know how to forgive because we haven't experienced forgiveness for ourselves. You may be here today. You may be still angry at your parents. My mother brought me a pair of shoes. She didn't take me along to town to even look at them. And I didn't like them one little bit. And I'm here to confess I wasn't a bit thankful. And I knew how to cry and, and make my point clear. I don't remember how old I was at this point. But that didn't impress Mom at all. I either wore the shoes or went barefooted. In the snow, uphill, both ways. And yes, you know how to repair shoes when the sole wears out. Or you just cut cardboard and put it in the bottom. And again, should I be upset with my parents? No, they were living in poverty themselves. They weren't uh, living extravagant lives, and I should have been uh, a thankful, uh, well-taught child, but I wasn't. I was a rebel like some of you were and still are. 
if you're not thankful for all things that God allows to cross your path. We're talking today, how do you overcome the, the, the possibility of a hardness of a heart when people take advantage of you? Expect that. You know, they'll lie about you. They'll steal, cheat, and rob you if you'll give them an opportunity. And they'll most of all misunderstand you and your position if you're not careful, if you have a position. Verse 34, we're supposed to have pity on those. The Lord was wroth. Notice that's a small L. This is the man that had the money and loaned it out and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Well, who are the tormentors? So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts, not just your head, not just our minds, but if you from your hearts forgive not everyone, that means saved people, lost people, best friends, worst friends, we have a responsibility biblically. If we don't, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses, here's what you can expect. The tormentors are coming to your house. They're going to come to your marriage. They're going to come to your business. They're going to come to your church if you don't learn to forgive. It's a learned process that we have to practice. And the only way we can get to practice, somebody has to mess up somewhere. Amen? And we have to be grown up, mature enough to know that that's reality. That's life. Problems come to the best of God's people and the worst. And let us be quick to say that normally more problems come to the worst people because they're not practicing any biblical principles. And if Satan can even get the best of God's people unforgiving, then he's won a bigger victory than he has if he's just, you know, kicking the, those around that aren't doing anything. So likewise, verse 35, shall my heavenly Father, and there's a capital F there, we're talking about God the Father at this point, do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Now what are some of these tormentors? I've listed a few. Guilt, shame, stress. Tension, anxiety, which leads to sinful addictions in many cases. I want to escape these feelings of guilt and shame and stress and tension. I've already tried praying and asking God to forgive me, but I'm still, I'm, I'm still wired up, the world would say. So I need to go get a medication. I need to go talk to the doctor. I need to go talk to the quack. And he's going to put me on the couch and figure out what's bothering me, and he's going to have the exact right prescription from his perspective. But that's not what you or your children need, maybe. What you or your children need to search your heart and say, what am I feeling guilty about? If Jesus died to pay for all my sins, why am I feeling like I have to have 14 cups of coffee just to get through the morning hours? Or 43 cases of uh, Coca-Cola uh, uh, stored up in the basement in case, uh, uh, in case we have a famine or a dirt. We may be depending on fleshly articles to survive the stress and the anxiety that the tormentors are bringing into my life because I have a hardness of heart. I have a hardness of arteries. Verse 19, chapter 19. These kind of hard things lead us to drugs and alcohol, sexual sins, food. No sin in food. It's only gluttony that's a sin. Sickness comes, weakness comes, and then death comes as a result of some of these tormentors that come to us. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily the, the food that's, uh, that's destroying, it's what's eating us that drives us to the food or the drink or the pornography. What is it that is causing me to seek these outside sources to satisfy the human flesh? Came to pass, or that's destroying marriages, it's destroying relationships came to pass that when Jesus had finished these things, notice this is in the same context. He just finished this story about forgiveness. He departed from Galilee and came unto the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Again, this is in the same context now. Here comes the Pharisees. What have they been thinking about? He's just teaching them about forgiveness, and now here comes the question. Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? By the way, uh, your birth certificate will tell you what you are. You don't need an operation to change that. God ordained what you are born, and you're supposed to stay that way, and God helped this sinful state of Massachusetts that's paying for somebody, a prisoner of all things, to have a sex change operation at our expense, thousands of tax dollars. 
May God help us to get some Christians in the office that would overturn some of these wicked things that are happening in the name of, yeah, in the name of the devil, we'd say they're happening. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? No. Have you not read, verse 4, that he which made them, he made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That's the miracle of marriage, very biblical marriage. Two people become one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain, no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You'll go to Harvard, you get your degree, go to MIT, you can get your degree, but what God puts together, God says, don't let man put it apart. You don't have any right to dis divorce anybody. And I don't either. We have a responsibility to try to teach them how to stay together. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorce and to put her away? And here comes the answer. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning it was not so. So today we're all struggling with unforgiveness to some degree. We're struggling with pride, stubbornness. I'm de I deserve better. I deserve superior treatment. All that represents a lack of humility. May God help us. If you want your marriage to last, you're going to have to apply biblical truth to your marriage. You say, well, everybody's guilty. Yeah, everybody's doing it. It reminds me of the four old cronies were sitting in the back of a local general store in a small New England town. It wasn't Medford. It was a small town. They were playing poker, of all things. So suddenly, the sheriff came through the door saying, gambling again, eh? This time, I'm going to take you fellows in to teach you a lesson. Well, there's more than one way to gamble, and poker is only one of them first old fellow spoke up. Not me, Sheriff. I just dropped in to talk. The Sheriff turned to the second man who drawled. Wasn't playing, Sheriff, just visiting. The Sheriff looked at the third man and inquired, What have you to say? The third codger languidly replied, Not guilty, Sheriff. I came to town to warm up at the stove. The fourth man sat quietly through the whole scene, studying the cards in his hand. When the Sheriff, with a smile of victory on his face, erupted, Well, you can't deny that you've been playing cards. Fourth old gray hair continued to look at the cards and he was holding and then in a mocking voice said, Now, Sheriff, who would I be playing with? <laughs> Here's a picture of the human race. Nobody is guilty. Everybody is innocent. If a man commits murder, he faces the judge saying, I'm not guilty. The bank robber, when caught, plods into court, blurting, I've done no wrong. Any lawbreaker, if forced to confront a judge, will declare, I was framed, Your Honor. The police are brutal. The simple fact is that the whole world is guilty before God. That includes me, includes you. The Apostle Paul said the sins men commit are the spinoff of one basic sin. That's unbelief. Romans 3, 19, Paul used one word which sinks the whole race in ruin. The word is guilty. Paul says the law speaks that all the world may become guilty before God. We're living in a world that's corrupted by sin and the guilt weighs heavy on every lost sinner. And that guilt can be replaced and transferred to us as saved people if we don't learn and practice forgiveness. May God help us. Yeah, the more spiritual, the stronger you grow spiritually, the more likely is Satan will use pride to destroy your life, your testimony, and mine as well if he can. The word, the word guilty is like a shell in a machine gun. It has power. It literally means to lose a lawsuit, according to Thayer's lexicon. In short, the sinner has lost his lawsuit before God. He has already been to court. The judge has banged his gavel and declared the defendant guilty and dismissed the court session. In fact, the whole world has lost its lawsuit. Men build their churches, invent their plans of salvation, wade through their religious rituals, are even dipped to be saved, but the great judge says they have lost the lawsuit. The man who has not lost in court is the man who has salvation. If you're here today as a saved man, Christ has gone to court for you and pleaded your case and mine. If you trust Christ as your Savior, the man walks out of the court a free man. The judge can never hustle him back into court for a retrial. Thank God for salvation on God's terms. If you have it today, be careful to guard it against unforgiveness towards others, against the hardness of heart that would cause your marriage to be hurting, deteriorating, falling apart I have here in closing just 10 or 12 principles
make our marriages better in honor of National Marriage Week, in honor of, of the love that the world celebrates by sending flowers and candy and special uh, meal, meals and all kinds of other things. Never both be angry at the same time. Wouldn't that be an ideal world if two people didn't get angry at the same time? Husbands and wives, the boss with the employee, friends, break, broken relationships. Never yell at each other unless the house is on fire. And then yell, get out, get out. If one of you has to win an argument, let it be your mate. Or let it be the boss. If you're, you're employed, you better let the boss be right. And he'll find somebody else. Remember, the customer's always right. Second, the boss is always right. Third, you're always wrong. So take the correction. Take the criticism. Do it lovingly. If you have to correct somebody, do it for their benefit, not to release you. The only concern we should have is trying to help somebody else. If we're spiritually mature and wanting to help somebody else would be the only reason you'd criticize your husband for not uh, doing what you think he ought to do or to balance that out, your wife. Never bring up sins of the past or mistakes even. Neglect the whole world rather than each other. That's why we're saying spend time with each other. Never go to sleep with anger and forgiveness. Unforgiveness, that is. And who's here today to say you've been married any length of time and never struggled with that thing of trying to go to sleep with a, a feeling of anger in your heart? Yeah, you can toss and turn and not go to sleep as God would want you to have sweet sleep if you could have forgiveness. At least once every day or try to say something kind or complimentary to your wife's or your husband's needs, your life's partner. When you've done something wrong, be ready to admit it and ask for forgiveness. And it takes two to make a quarrel, and the one in the wrong is usually the one who does the most talking or yells the loudest or pouts the longest. Are you a yeller or a powder? We all would fall into one category or the other. Say, well, no, I'm neither. I'm perfect. It's my spouse that has the problem. Beware. Uh, somebody's talking to you, and I'm not sure it's the Bible. Or if it is, it's the old devil of the Bible that's trying to convince you you're above the rest of society. It's okay to disagree, but to not to argue or verbally be unkind or angry is the challenge beyond sunset. Let's resolve our conflicts quickly as we can and, and ask God to help us have a soft, forgiving heart. The options aren't biblical. That is, uh, the options of broken relationships, hardness of hearts, do leading to divorce. There is uh, one exclusion here that you can get a divorce, verse 9. And this is for single people. Fornication is the sin of sexual immorality before marriage, and here's your, here's your exclusion from marriage. Verse 9, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, and that's in reference to a, what we would call the engagement period. That would be what Joseph and Mary were uh, qualified. Joseph could have called off the marriage because his wife became pregnant, during the what we would call the courting process, except it be for fornication. It looked all indications that she had been uh, guilty of fornication to get pregnant outside of marriage and shall marry another. You can call off your marriage, young people, and I suggest you at least have a nine-month waiting period. It wouldn't hurt to be a year uh, to get to know each other. Uh, and then if uh, she does show up pregnant or he shows up still looking at pornography, you want to find that out before you get married. As we said in Sunday school, just getting married isn't going to eliminate your desire to look at other women's bodies, and that's going to create conflict in your marriage. So let's talk about those things before you get married. Don't think you know everything there is to know, and I suggest you get some counseling if you haven't already discussed these things like finances, uh, communication, uh, where's the mother-in-law going to live, uh, <laughs> uh, what are we going to do for money, if he decides that he's addicted to television or uh, some of these games that now uh, adults enjoy playing uh, morning, noon, and night. Uh, and again, some of us old-timers, we don't have to worry about that. They're too complicated. We can't even turn them on. <laughs> and some have the other problem. They can't turn them off. May God help us to get the balance here, the spiritual balance in life. Are you prepared to deal with forgiveness? It's going to be coming your way sooner or later. If it's not already on your plate, remember, somebody's going to cross your path somewhere sooner or later, and you better decide today you're going to forgive them. You're not going to get a hardness of heart. 
You're not going to hit them in the nose with a baseball bat. Uh, they go to jail. Some people may end up in jail for that kind of response. You want to learn how to be a kind, loving, forgiving person. And if the person that hits you with the bat still has the bat, you may want to have enough love for that person to say, you may want to consider getting rid of that bat and maybe getting uh, a few uh, packages of, uh, uh, of cotton to throw at people that you don't like because it won't hurt them as bad. And you may have time to count to ten before you lose your temper again. I come from a family of Germans, uh, they told me, and my uncle was known for losing his temper. Our house had, our old farmhouse had real low ceilings, and right there in the middle of one room of all things was a light bulb. The story was his head hit the light bulb, broke the light, shattered the light, and in a fit of anger, you could still see his fist mark up there in the ceiling. I think that must have hurt a little bit, whether it hurt his pride or just hurt the fact that he lost his temper, and he was one of the most spiritual uncles that I had on my dad's side. Uh, and I, I have good memories of him, nice talks with him. But the best of us can lose our temper uh, if the circumstances are right. And we can say unkind things that we wish we didn't say. We can do unkind things to our children that we better go back and say, look, I'm sorry, I lost my temper. I really don't hate you. And if you said you hated me, I think you, you didn't really mean that, did you? And I'm sorry that I aggravated you to that point. But let's get back to the Bible here. It says you're supposed to honor me. Don't let your children swing at you or hit you. Uh, you've got a rebellion there that you want to get rid of that real soon. Uh, they hit you with their, their arm. You see that happening sometime in the store. And there, there's not the place to take their diaper off and spank them. Uh, but you want to do it at home consistently enough that they'll know how to behave out in public. Consistent enough to know that they're going to respond correctly in the store because they know how to respond at the house. And guess what? They'll respond right at church, too, if you learn to teach them at home and read the Bible with them, pray, hug them a lot, tell them you love them, and that you forgive them for their bad behavior, but that they're going to learn that they can't get away with bad behavior in the home, or they'll try it out at church. Or when they get to college, they will be uh, doing the kind of things that we're saying, no, no, that's not Christianity that we are talking about. It's doesn't take a long time to have a marriage ceremony, but it does take a long time to make a marriage run smoothly. And again, uh, it's not all over. The rough ride isn't all over when you reach the 20th or the 30th or the 40th year. There's still some uh, potholes in the streets of Medford. They didn't get them all fixed just yet, and there's still some potholes in the Christian life for married people and single people, for young people and older people. There's some things to look out for. And if you don't have a forgiving, kind, gentle heart, you're going to get a proud, rebellious, stubborn, unforgiving heart that's going to hurt you and maybe somebody that's close to you. Because bitterness can spread quicker than godliness can spread, sad to say. If you have some polluted food in your, in your refrigerator, all you have to do is eat a little bit of it, and you'll be sick for quite a while. And if you give it to your best friend, chances are, uh, if it's food poisoned, that, that he's going to get sick too. So you don't want to spread your bitterness. It's like an evil that is contagious and will spread real quickly to destroy marriages, to destroy churches, destroy our country. And our country is full of sick people that need the gospel. It's full of sinful people that need the gospel. And here is the remedy. Here is the recipe for good health, physically and spiritually. And it starts with having a forgiving heart like God has forgiven us of a multitude of sins. It starts by our being willing to forgive a multitude of sinners around us. Like sitting there beside you today, for example. Chances are you're sitting beside a sinner. If not, you're in a row all by yourself. And may God bless you to get close enough that you can forgive a sinner, whether it's a saved sinner or a lost sinner. That's the solution to living a biblically obedient Christian life. Let's pray. Lord, we're filled with challenges today for the singles, for the married, the divorced, the widows, the teenagers facing life with all of its challenges all of the trials, the tests to help us grow in grace and not to groan in disgrace if we're saved. Help us to be it dependent on the Holy Spirit of God to help us. We can't do it in the flesh, but with the Spirit of God, we can do it. May God will give us the desire to do it for His glory. How many would say, Pastor, as best I know, I'm a saved man. 
I'm born again. I'm a Christian woman. I'm on my way to heaven by the grace of God. I'm not depending on myself. I've been saved, washed in the blood. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. Is there somebody you're not sure what we're talking about? Maybe you've come in, you're a guest, a visitor today, or you've been here before. You don't understand the assurance of salvation. You're not assured that you're saved. May I pray for you in closing today? You're not sure you're saved anywhere, front, back, side, left, right, uh, balcony. Uh, are you saved today? If not, God wants you to know that you have salvation available. It's a gift. It's not depending on how good or bad you are. It's a gift of God's forgiveness to you and to me, to the whole world. Are you satisfied that you've been sharing it with those you've been rubbing shoulders with? Or are you in need of extra grace to confront lost people? Is there somebody that's broken a relationship with you that you feel has offended you and hurt you? You need to go talk to them, restore a relationship. Now's the time to decide that. It's not easy to confront lost people. It's not easy to confront Christians, but it must be done or hardness of heart is the result if you have an unforgiving spirit. That's a spirit that God wants to forgive you of and help you to have victory with me and you and everybody that's hearing this message. Father, have your will in the closing part of this service. Submission does not begin until we do something that we don't want to do. We don't want to admit that we're lost on our way to hell. We don't want to admit that we're proud and we don't like to get dipped under the water in front of people. We don't want to give out a gospel track and people think we are weird or unusual. So help us to bring our pride and our stubbornness and our rebellion under your control that we would forget about our feelings and be concerned about your feelings and have a soft, forgiving heart everywhere we go. All of our life we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come as we sing. and We'll help you any way we can. 207, please. Would you turn with me to 207 in the songbook? 207. <clears throat> Let's all stand together. Not have I gotten but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, cried I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. Once I was foolish, and sin ruled my heart, causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus has found me, happy my case. I now am a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Tears unavailing, no merit had I. Mercy had saved me, or else I must die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face. But now I'm a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. Only a sinner, saved by grace. This is my story, to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. If that's all you are today, you may want to thank him for being that. You may want to come and say, thank you, Lord, for the victory, or thank you for the challenge. I'm going to kneel at the altar as an example that we shouldn't be too proud. If it's been a few weeks, a few months since you've ever kneeled at an old-fashioned altar and said, Thank you, Lord, for giving me the victory. You may have gotten the victory while we were singing, while I was preaching. But if you don't have the victory, you come too. Nobody knows the difference whether you're coming to thank God for the victory or you're coming to get the victory. That's the purpose of the invitation. Please respond accordingly as we sing the last stanza and we'll be dismissed. 
Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows, loving his Savior to tell what he knows. Once more to tell it would I embrace, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Near the front, sometimes it's hard to get my attention at the door. So Brother Brewer is there. Other man will be there to greet you at the door. I'll be up here in case you want to talk about. Maybe you misunderstood something I said. Maybe the Lord allowed you to misunderstand to get the point that you needed. But if there is a question, don't rush off. We'll be back here tonight, 6 o'clock. Don't forget the service tonight. Special time of fellowship afterwards with the cookies and the, the drinks and the time to just to get to know each other and share your request and to become accountable to other godly Christians. It'll help you to grow in grace so you don't get a hardness of heart. It's good to have our good friend Mo Anderson here. Won't you dismiss us in prayer if you would? Brother Mo Anderson.